Well, thank you, Gerald. And uh, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be back at CMU. I was here, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe, and long enough ago that memories have now faded and they invited me back. Um, <laughs> But I remember well the mission and work uh, and ministry of the school, and especially its care for uh, pastors and church leaders. Uh, it's very impressive, and I'm glad to be a part of this day. Um, flew into Winnipeg Airport yesterday and went through customs and immigration, of course, and uh, I handed the guy my passport, and he was kind of bored, and he leafed through it, and he said, uh, what are you going to be doing in Canada? It's always the first question. And I said, I'm going to a conference at Canadian Mennonite University, still bored. He said, oh yeah, uh, what's the conference about? <laughs> I said, death, dying, and funerals. His eyes got like little slits, like you're kidding me, right? I said, no. And he asked me a series of questions, each more suspicious than the one before. And finally he said, go on through. I think he thought I was crazy, but not dangerous. Uh, <laughs> today and tomorrow, we're going to be talking about ministry, about preaching and uh, worship and pastoral care around the realities of death and dying. And one thing that everybody in the room knows is that we're going to be talking about these issues in the context of enormous flux and change in terms of all of our practices about this. Uh, Daniel Callahan, who wrote a book called The Troubled Dream of Life a number of years ago, uh, said that every great culture, every great culture has a characteristic view of death ordinarily accompanied by public rituals, customary practices, and time-honored patterns of communal grief. Well, not, not anymore. We don't have a common cultural view of death. Our culture has broken apart right at this point. Let me suggest some of the signs of change that I'm seeing and you're seeing as well. Uh, by the way, one minister told me, in my 40 years of ministry, nothing has changed more than the way I do funerals and memorial services. He said, but I would still prefer to do a funeral and memorial service over a wedding. <laughs> because I have learned that at weddings, I am simply an ornament. Uh, but at funerals, I still have something to say. The first change that's swirling around us, um, we all know about the rise of the nuns, how our children and grandchildren, how the teenagers and 20-somethings, when given an opportunity to, to select their preferred religion, select none of the, of the above. Well, the same sort of currents that are operating in religious life about nuns are operating in death rituals about nuns. I go to a lot of uh, meetings with funeral directors, and one of the things that befuddles funeral directors is the number of people in the last decade and a half who have told them, no service at all, please. To which they first think, oh, you must mean no service down at the church. Uh, perhaps you'd like something in the funeral chapel, or we can work out something in the living room. Of, no, no, I'm telling you, no service whatsoever. The inability or unwillingness to commemorate publicly a death, but to allow it to retreat into the personal and private. Uh, in the States, the Gallup pollsters every several years do a survey of American religion, and they always ask the police this one question, have you attended a religious service in the last seven days? mosque, synagogue, church. Have you attended a religious service in the last seven days? In the mid-70s, 44% of Americans said they had. <laughs> they were lying, of course. Um, <laughs> when we actually counted them, they were only 31% that we could find. In the mid-80s, 44% said that they had attended a service. They were really lying, only 29%. In 2008, 44% said, <laughs> but only 24% actually had. In 2016, something happened. 36% said they had. The public shame or disapproval of not attending a service was beginning to lessen, but only 15% of them actually had. Attendance at funerals is also down. 
Attendance at funerals is also down. Interestingly enough, attendance at visitations and wakes is slightly up. And this afternoon, when we think about the funeral together, I'll speculate about why uh, I think that is. But whatever is happening in our culture to create the nuns and the vacant pews is also happening for the funeral industry in terms of the civic uh, uh, observation of death. The, the second remarkable change is the rather dramatic rise in cremation. Uh, now, I, uh, cremation to me is an absolutely perfectly acceptable form of the disposition of the corpse uh, in death. I have no objection, and most religious traditions that did object to cremation have pulled back on that. Uh, but the rise in it is striking. In Canada in 1970, fewer than 6% of people uh, were cremated. Now it's slightly less than 80%. Uh, we're a little behind that in the States, but rapidly catching up. Now, you ask people, why in the world do you cremate rather than bury? Most people will give you one of two reasons, economical or ecological. That is to say, cremation is cheaper or it is a more responsible stewardship of the environment. Um, actually, um, neither of those is actually true. Um, uh, even though there is some economic advantage in cremation at this point, death is a commodity in our capitalistic society, and the gap between full funeral and cremation is rapidly narrowing. Uh, to burn a body creates a carbon footprint that is uh, just as bad as to embalm a corpse and put it into the ground. The only ecological way to do this is to do this as our great-grandparents did, and that is to prepare the body at home and put the body in a pine box in the earth. That's ecologically responsible. But when you push a little bit harder, even people who say, I cremate for ecological reasons or economic reasons, uh, it turns out not to be true. Uh, most people in North America cremate uh, for the sake of convenience. Uh, a dead body is an inconvenience. I think a good inconvenience, by the way, as we'll say later, but it's an inconvenience. And so as my friend Thomas Lynch, the funeral director, says, what he's told most often is, uh, my grandmother uh, has died and we uh, want you to just cremate her. And the emphasis is on just cremate her. Uh, the third thing that is uh, interesting in terms of the flux and change is the fact that the memorial service without a body or ashes uh, has become the standard practice in churches over against an embodied funeral. There is a historic reason for this. Uh, in the older funeral traditions, as exemplified, for example, in the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer, Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the funeral service uh, 250 years ago was a single seamless service that had as its last component the committal of the body to the earth. Uh, you can tell from the rubrics in these old services that it was never intended to hold the funeral in a church building. The old rubrics are that the priest was supposed to meet the family coming with the pallbearers from the home at the gate of the church and then accompany them to the grave plot in the graveyard on the side, and the service would be conducted entirely at graveside from beginning to end, one se seamless movement. But then, in the early 19th century, we began to believe on false scientific grounds that the dead were killing us. What we began to think scientifically was that decomposing bodies emitted a gas known as miasma, and that gas went down into the earth and got into the water supply, and it went out into the atmosphere, so we both drank it and breathed it in, and it was toxic. So what began to develop was what is known as the rural cemetery movement, in which the idea was to get cemeteries outside of town so that the dead could no longer pollute us. So we built beautiful willow treed uh, bridges over brooks kind of cemeteries out from town, which meant that you had to ride in a chariot or a carriage or on a horse 
for a while to get out to the cemetery. At that point, the prayer books changed and the service ended before the committal service. Then there was a dot, 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 and then there was a separate section called a committal. Then the next edition of the prayer books made the committal service a separate chapter, a, a separate service. And when you had the two of them separated, they became interchangeable. And so it is now the pattern for most of us in uh, suburban settings particularly to do whatever we're going to do with the dead body first and then to move to a disembodied memorial service. Along with that, there is, uh, and this is another sign of change, the death of the old cemetery and the birth of new conceptions of the cemetery. Uh, David Charles Stone has written, Sloan has written a really interesting book called Is the Cemetery Dead? And in that book, he describes his own experience. He is the son of a cemetery caretaker and grew up in a cemetery, watched the rituals there, and recognizes that the millennials and younger have no real interest in a plot of ground and a granite monument, a place that is expensive to which they will never go. So what's developing, of course, are the virtual cemeteries. If you haven't seen one, you should Google virtual cemetery and you will find pictures of the dead, descriptions of their life, tributes to them, and sometimes a link you can click and spookily hear the sound of the voice uh, of the dead, the virtual cemetery. Along with that, another sign of change is the rise of roadside shrines, crosses on the highway, um, uh, settings of vases and uh, beer cans and welding helmets and uh, signs of the place where the person died. Where there's been dramatic public death, there seems to be in our culture a need to memorialize it right at the point and place where it happened. Uh, I'm going to argue later on that that's a replacement of the completed journey of the Christian funeral with the incomplete and interrupted journey of sudden death. Finally, you probably have noticed that services have moved toward great personalization, open mic ceremonies in which uh, cousins and nephews and friends speak at the mic, objects uh, with the, uh, that are connected to the person displayed on tables, videos uh, shown. And there's been a change of terminology for these. Instead of a funeral or a memorial service, it's a celebration of life. Um, Sarah wouldn't want us to be sad today, uh, and so let's celebrate life. That fits into what Dan was saying about the inability to bring authentic, honest grief uh, into the ceremony. All right, everything's in flux. There is no common celebration of things. Uh, we are pastors and church leaders and decision makers who are trying to help people uh, right at the, this critical point in life and death. What to do? What to do? It is said that Tolstoy's final words when he died were, I do not understand what I'm supposed to do now. <laughs> well, neither do we. Uh, James White, the Methodist liturgical scholar in the 1970s, when everybody was experimenting with worship, uh, multimedia and so on, wrote a book called New Forms of Worship, 1971. And it, in that book, he had a chapter titled, You Are Free, if. You are free if. And what he meant by that is you are free to improvise, to do the new thing if you are rooted in the tradition so that you know what it is you're improvising off of. If you don't know what you're improvising off of, then you're simply uh, untethered. Uh, I tell my students on the first day in preaching class, this preaching class will be like studying how to be a chef at the French Culinary Institute. You, however, will be working at Denny's. <laughs> Sundays come fast, you'll have to sling the hash. <laughs> but if you've been to the French Culinary Institute, there'll be a little bit of the gourmet meal in every plate of eggs that you serve. 
Um, now, we have to get out there on the field with people who are confused about life and death and to guide them in the dying process and in the funeral process. And a lot of the things that I'm going to say today are out of the French Culinary Institute. And they are in many ways and in many times not going to be achievable. Uh, you have to audible on the field, as a quarterback would say, when you see that things are different in the actual game itself. And so uh, if you know, however, what the Christian vision of death is and what the Christian rite of a funeral is, then you're free because the improvisations that you will do will come off of the traditions. So let's start our thinking about what we are to do as preachers and leaders in the face of dying and grief, particularly this morning, grief and the dying process. Several years ago, I had just finished a nice lunch in a Chinese restaurant, and the waiter brought over my check. And along with a little dish uh, with my check on it, he had a cellophane-wrapped fortune cookie. So I opened up the fortune cookie and cracked it open and took out my fortune, expecting it to be the usual, you will meet a new friend this week, or your dreams will come true. But instead, this one read, resolve all your unfinished business immediately. <laughs> I said, what, what is this? A fortune cookie is warning me about my death? What, you know, has somebody had a bad day at the fortune cookie factory? Or did the waiter look at the color of my complexion and say, this guy needs the death one. Let's do <laughs> well, I didn't take it seriously. It's just a fortune cookie. But I did, I did realize that down deep I was insulted by this. How dare they throw death into my face? And in that sense, I am a child of my culture. This is a culture that is insulted by having death thrust in its face. Now, some people say we live in a death-denying culture. Uh, I don't think that's quite right. I don't think we quite live in a death-denying culture. We watch thousands of deaths on television and in the movies. They're simulated, of course, but they're there before us. And it may be that Jeffrey Gower, uh, whose book Death, Grief, and Meaning, gets closer to it when he says, in our culture, death is pornography. Death is pornography. That is to say, it's something that is taboo, and it's not something to be talked about always and everywhere. You don't bring it up at a dinner party. But as a matter of fact, we're voyeur voyeuristically interested in it. Uh, Tom uh, Oden has remarked about our curiosity about death. We are always interested in it, but it's usually death in general or the death of others. And Oden says, uh, everybody intellectually knows I'm going to die, but existentially refuses to accept it. Intellectually, we know we're going to die, and uh, existentially, we refuse, not me. I'm actually not going to die. Aren't you going to die? Yes, I know I'm going to die, but are you going to die? No, I'm, I'm not going to die. So I was insulted by this fortune cookie that suggested that my existential approach was not valid. Uh, by the way, in the States, do you have this in Canada? If you have a road that doesn't go anywhere, it's got a sign at the front of it that says dead end. What does yours say? No exit. No exit. Well, you're way ahead of us. <laughs> In the States, only Longmont, Colorado has taken all the dead end signs out and replaced them with no outlet because they did not want to be reminded every time they made a turn in the car that they were headed toward their death. When I wrote Accompany Them with Singing the Christian Funeral, I was interviewed on a Houston, Texas uh, NPR station, FM radio station, and we went through the book, the host and I, and then they opened up the phone lines for callers. And no one talked about what the host and I had been talking about at all. The content of the book they completely ignored. What they wanted to talk about was how furious they were about funeral homes gouging them financially at the time that they lost a loved one. Now, I get that. The average funeral in the States costs $11,000. That's a lot of money. The average wedding in the States cost $48,000. 
And it leads me to think that part of the rage at the cost and the funeral director is because it's a rage at death. Because it comes as an insult and it comes unexpectedly and it comes as a deprivation. Sometimes we say what we really want is to die with dignity, a dignified death. Well, you can hardly blame someone for wanting to have a dignified death. But as a matter of fact, smuggled into that language, the dignity of death is an attempt to control and repress the idea of death. As Sherwin Newland, the physician who published that great book, How We Die, a number of years ago pointed out, there is no dignified death. No death, whether it's from cancer or a heart attack or Alzheimer's or from whatever source is dignified. He tells in the book about a woman who had just seen her own mother die of cancer and she was deeply hurt by what she had seen. She said, I expected it to be more dignified. And he said, no, there is no dignity in this kind of death medically. And theologically, that's true as well. Death is the final enemy. And it does not bring us dignity. All death is undignified. What we seek as Christians is not a dignified death, but a sacred death. Jesus did not die a dignified death, but he died a sacred death. And the reason I bring that up is that Christians before us have known that one of the responsibilities of the church is to help people in the Christian faith die well, to die a sacred death. In 1963, a Christian lay dying in Rome. He was an Italian peasant. His baptismal name was Angelo Roncalli, but we knew him a lot better as Pope John the 23rd. He was dying of cancer and in the papal apartment, his deathbed was surrounded by his young Italian physician, his secretary, a few aides, and a friend or two from his old town. At one point, the young physician went over to the bed, took out his stethoscope and listened and took vitals. And then he said to the Pope, Holy Father, you have always made me promise that I would tell you when your hour has come. With great sadness, I must tell you, your hour is now. At that point, the Pope's secretary collapsed beside the bed in tears. And with what strength he had left, Pope John XXIII reached out and touched the head of his secretary and said, do not feel badly, I am ready. I am a bishop, I must die with simplicity and majesty and you must help me. Now, I think in that statement is a powerfully Christian attitude toward one's own dying. Notice the juxtaposition. I'm a bishop. I must die with simplicity and majesty. The simplicity is we need no ornaments. We need no hearses and limos. We need no ermine-lined caskets. Uh, we are doing this in simplicity because we are children of God. Majesty, thou, is because I am a child of the heavenly king, and every Christian dies a royal death and deserves a royal funeral. Several years ago, I was invited to preach at Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. Concord Baptist Church, as some of you may know, was the church where for decades, the great Gardner Taylor was the pastor and preacher. He's known as the Dean of African American Preachers. He was one of the best preachers who ever lived. And I thought to myself, I'm standing in Gardner Taylor's pulpit. I patted myself on the back. Well, I can assure you, the sermon that morning was of no consequence. <laughs> because what really was of con consequence was there was a postal clerk who'd been sick for six months and this was his first Sunday back. They spent 45 minutes celebrating his return to the communion of faith. I must do this with simplicity, but with majesty because he's a child of the heavenly king. And I am ready. 
And when he said he was ready, he meant more than simply the fact that he was facing up to the ultimate death that was coming from cancer. What he meant was his whole Christian life had been a preparation for this moment. As a matter of fact, beginning in the 1500s, Christians developed a devotional literature, and I'm going to suggest that we try to recover this impulse. They developed a devotional literature designed to help people dress rehearse their own deaths. The literature was called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying or the art of dying well. And uh, this literature was used by people who were not dying as they acquired the vocabulary, impulses, and attitudes uh, necessary that when the time did come, they had a chance of dying well. Some of this literature was in the form of a dialogue between Satan and a dying Christian. Uh, the dying Christian would be there at the end of life. Satan would be a pastoral counselor from hell, literally. <laughs> and this is... <laughs> Here's an example of a piece of that devotional literature. Satan speaks first. You're frightened, aren't you? Yes, I am frightened, but I am trusting my Savior who calms my fears. Oh, really? You think you're going to be rewarded by Jesus, don't you? You who have no righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. Oh, Christ is your righteousness. You think Christ will welcome you into the company of Peter and Paul and the apostles, you who have sinned over and over? No, I'm not going into the company of Peter and Paul. I'm going into the company of the thief on the cross who heard the promise, today you'll be with me in paradise. Why are you so confident you've done nothing good? I have God's forgiveness and mercy. Legions of demons are salivating, waiting for your soul. And I would be helpless before them if the Lord had not already crushed your tyranny. <laughs> Try that with your youth group. Uh, <laughs> you see what's going on there? Every mood, every fear, every anxiety that a person is going to feel at the point of death is being anticipated here. And then a vocabulary is being provided to resist it. Uh, and th this was dress rehearsing one's own death. Far from being insulted by a fortune cookie, one welcomed the opportunity to put oneself in the position of the dying Christian and to prepare for it so that one might die well. Well, how can we help people die well? How can we die well ourselves? I know a lot of churches that have gotten involved in, we need to prepare people for death, and what they usually do is to develop a, a questionnaire or an inventory in which they ask people to put, what's your insurance policy? Uh, what hymns do you want in your service? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that's fine, but that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe a better way to get at this would be if you're a prayer book tradition, take your funeral service. If you're not a prayer book tradition, write one out that you use. And then go through that with your congregation. Look at the language of the prayers. Look as we did today at the language of Psalm 23 and the scriptures that might be used. And give people the vocabulary that they will have at the time of death. Um, a friend of mine died recently and he spent his last days in hospice, not bemoaning himself, but surrounding himself with friends and family and telling stories, cherishing memories, reading scripture. And at the funeral, I was standing in line to speak to the family after the funeral, and a woman in front of me said out loud to the air, to no one in particular, you know, he taught us how to live, and now he's taught us how to die. I think that um, one of the ways to think about preparing people to die, Brett McCarty and Alan Verhey have a nice essay called The Virtues for Dying Well, and I'm going to mention three of the virtues that they talk about and how we might think about them. They're over against temptations that happen, just like that uh, Ars Moriendi literature. All the anxieties and all the fears are met with virtues. 
And the first temptation of dying people and the people around them is to lose their faith. The first temptation is to lose your faith. Uh, in David Stannard's book on the Puritans, he said the Puritans trained themselves all their lives to be stoic in the face of death. No tears, no doubts, just lie there, confident in the gospel. Stannard says most Puritans died screaming and in fear because they had lost their faith. And the reason they had lost their faith is they had been given an unrealistic understanding of what faith looks like when it faces to death, when it faces death. Um, William May, who is a medical ethicist, said, sometimes people, when they are faced with the prospect of visiting the dying, don't go because they don't know what to say. And the reason why they don't know what to say is because they fear that their job is to take Christ into the room, and they don't know what Christ would be like in the room. What they need to be told is Jesus Christ is already there in the room. And you are not to take Christ into the room. You are to go and be with the person who has died in the full confidence that Christ will surround you. And what that means is, when we are gathered around someone who is dying and we know that their faith is being tested, what we bring is not some sort of an argument about why they should continue to believe. What we bring are the resources we have always brought. We bring the scriptures and we bring ourselves and we bring uh, prayers. Uh, I was sitting at a table at a church conference one time and struck up a conversation with a guy, a Lutheran layman, and we both discovered that we had lost our mothers in hospice within the last few months. And I said to him, you know, one of the strangest things about being in hospice is that the first few days you say to the one you're about to lose, Mama, I, I love you. Uh, I you have blessed me. Uh, I am grateful to God for you. You say all the things that you should say, and then you don't want to keep saying them because it cheapens things just to keep saying them, and a kind of silence falls over the hospice room. And my Lutheran friend said, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. He said, one night, my uh, sister and I and my teenage son were keeping vigil with my mother, and there was a silence in the room. We, we didn't know what to say. And then out of the blue, my sister started singing A Mighty Fortress. Well, we were Lutherans, we knew that one, so uh, we got into it. And when we finished that one, uh, she started another Lutheran hymn. We knew that one, we sang that, and we sang one hymn out of the hymn book after another. And it dawned on me, uh, this is why we learned these hymns for a moment like this. They are the resource. He said, I turned to my son, he's not into church. I turned to my son and I said, look, I don't want to crimp your style, but you, you got to learn these hymns because someday you're going to sing them when I'm dying. <laughs> there is a Psalm 77, which starts with 10 verses of railing out in rage and uh, faithless doubt in the face of a God who has abandoned the psalmist. You know, you don't care for me anymore. You don't love me anymore. I'm suffering so grievously. In fact, what bothers me the most is you don't have any power. Then the psalmist stops right in the middle and he takes a vow. All right, I will call to mind the mighty acts of God. It's not an act of the emotions, it's an act of the will. All right, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to call to mind. And what he remembers is the Exodus. And in the Exodus, the psalmist suddenly sees things that he had missed before that give him comfort in his sense of alienation and abandonment. Your way, O oh God, was through the sea, not around the sea, above the sea, beside the sea, but right through the trouble. Your footprints were not seen. When you were most powerful, you were least visible. You led us by the hand of Moses and Aaron. It was through other people who were given around us that we were guided through the trouble. And I wonder if around dying people, 
We might remember times with them when the faith felt good and strong, and to let them see in the fabric of their own memory and experience the power that is there. Lewis Smedes is a, an American theologian, and he described another challenge before us. Sometimes in the face of death or in preparing for death, people need to rethink their own theology, and that's best done in community and not by themselves. He and his wife Doris had been trying to have a child unsuccessfully. And then he tells this, we had spent a decade making love according to a schedule set by four different fertility clinics in three different countries. And finally, after one summer night's lark on the sand dunes of Lake Michigan with no thought but love, Doris became a medically certified pregnant woman. Six months along, doing fine, we thought, with God answering our prayers, it could be no other way but fine. She suddenly one night began losing amniotic fluid. I called her doctor. She's going into labor, he said. Get her to the hospital as fast as you can. And then he said he was sorry, but our baby was going to be badly malformed. How badly? Very. We fumbled silent and bewildered into the car. I told her, we cried, we promised God and each other that we would love the child no matter how damaged she or he was. After Doris had been tucked in, I went to the waiting room to worry for a few hours and suddenly Doris's doctor broke in and exulted, congratulations, Lou, you're the father of a perfect man child. I told Doris the news, she was skeptical, but I went home and danced like David before the Lord. The next day, just before noon, our pediatrician called I'd better come down to the hospital right away. When I met him, he told me that our miracle child was dead. Two mornings later, with a couple of friends at my side and our minister reading the ceremony, we buried him. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, Doris never got to see the child. A pious neighbor comforted me by reminding me that God was in control. I wanted to say, not this time. I had been intellectually excited by Calvin's tough-minded belief that all things, and he really meant all of them, including the ghastly and horrible, happen when and how where they, they happen precisely as God decreed. A horrific decree. Well, I don't want God to make things plain. If God could show us that there was a good and necessary reason for such a bad thing to have happened, it must not have been a bad thing after all, and I cannot accommodate that thought. I just don't have the right stuff for such hard-boiled theology. I'm no more able to believe that God micromanages the death of little children than I'm able to believe that God was micromanaging Hitler's Holocaust. With one morning's retching experience, I knew my portrait of God would have to be repainted. How many of our people are having to repaint their portrait, of, uh, their portrait of God, their theology? And they shouldn't be left to do that alone. Those of us who love them should gather around them. Um, the second thing I want to say is that a change in eschatology has left people uncertain about what to hope for. In the 19th century, for some reason, we began to lose our eschatological nerve. What I mean by that is ordinary Christians had been given a kind of literalistic picture of what to hope for at the time of death, and it began to collapse on them. The literalistic picture was something like this. Grandmama has died, but have hope because grandmama has gone to heaven and there Jesus and Peter and Paul have greeted her and taken her into the new Jerusalem where she walks the streets of gold. And when we die, we will recognize her there and we will all be reunited. Now there's power and beauty in that imagery, but when people took it literally, as they were encouraged to do by their pastors, it began to come apart for them intellectually. Drew Gilpin Faust, who is the president of Harvard, wrote a book called The Republic of Suffering, talking about how, for Americans anyway, the Civil War was a very deep assault on the simplistic theology of hope. 
because it's, it's fine to think this theology when people die one by one. But when you have 500,000 dead people on the battlefields of Pennsylvania and Maryland, mass death overwhelms the picture of Jesus welcoming people uh, one by one. And people began to lose under this kind of intellectual assault, under the growth of science. They, they simply couldn't imagine heaven as we had pictured it for them. How should we picture it for them? Well, Christopher Morse, who taught systematic theology at Union Seminary, has a brilliant new book called The Difference Heaven Makes. And in that book, he looks at every single uh, image of heaven that we have in the New Testament. And when he puts them all together, what he sees there is that heaven is not primarily the place where we go after we die. In the New Testament, heaven is primarily the place from which God comes to us. God speaks from heaven. God acts from heaven. Heaven is almost an image or metaphor for the life of God. And what he says is, we live in an adventing world. And in this adventing world, the kingdom of God keeps crashing into our experience, one uh, wave after another. And he ends the book by saying, it is the task of a disciple to be on hand for that which is at hand, but not in hand. <laughs> it's the task of a Christian to be on hand, always waiting, looking alert to that which is at hand, the life of God coming into ours, but not in hand, not under our control. Which means, I think, that in order to get at what we are thinking about in terms of our eschatological hope, we have to talk about it in two somewhat complementary, somewhat competing ways. We have to talk about a future hope in which the sea that keeps slapping in on history becomes all in all, and then a present hope in which the waves break into our current experience. In terms of the future hope, the great preacher George Buttrick used to love to tell the story of the church in New York City that had over its chancel a big stained glass window of the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And the congregation hated it <laughs> because it was gaudy, pious, otherworldly, aquamarine river of life, emeralds, pearls, angels. They said, we live in New York, the gritty realities of the street, that's where we do our ministry. But Buttrick said the window was not an expensive one, and over the years, the colors in the window began to fade so that ever so faintly, the congregation could see through the window to the outline of the tenements and the skyscrapers in the city. He said, then the window began to take on power because the New Jerusalem gave them a picture of hope and the New York skyline gave them a place of mission and the merging of the two gave them power. Now that means as ministers, I think, we are always ambassadors of a future that is promised but not yet in hand. We're on hand for that which is at hand but not yet in hand. A friend of mine, a pastor of a church in Atlanta, was taking his wife to a Valentine's dinner one night. They met at the church, went out to the parking lot, and were just about to get in the car to go to the restaurant when they saw an elderly man collapse on the sidewalk by the church. They rushed over to him. He was clutching his chest. And my friend said to his wife, go call an ambulance. I'll stay here with him. He took off his coat and put it over the man so he would be warm. And as he bent over him, he started to say, we're calling for help. But the man said, Charlie, forgive me. What he did not know at that point was that Charlie was the man's son that they had been estranged for years. And now as he was facing the end of his life, he said, Charlie, forgive me. My friend said, uh, just relax, be calm. We're, we're calling for an ambulance. You'll get some, Charlie, please forgive me. I, I want you to be calm now because we'll get some medical attention. We're going to take you to the, Charlie, I am begging you, please forgive me. It was then my friend looking into fading 
eyes, realized what he must do. And he reached out and put his hand on the man's head and said, I forgive you. Now, after the man had died, my friend began to have doubts about what he had done. What right did he have to speak forgiveness for somebody else? What, what right did he have to pronounce forgiveness anyway? And then he said, I realized that's what I do in all of my ministry. I am an amb ambassador for a time when forgiveness will be greater than estrangement, when forgiveness and healing will be all in all. And I am always speaking a word from the future into the present. But there is also a sense in which the breaking in of the kingdom gives hope because of experiences in the present tense. When we can see the thing itself, it's not a future promise, but it's breaking through right at hand. There was a woman when I was at Princeton who was a member of our congregation who was at Princeton Hospital dying of breast cancer. And she called up, after reading the book of James, she called up the pastor of our church, the Presbyterian Church in Princeton, and said, I would like for you to bring some members of the session over here to anoint me with oil. And the pastor said, what? She said, I've been reading the book of James, and it says that when someone is sick, you should anoint them with oil. And the pastor said, uh, Graylin, I don't think so. She said, why? He said, because I practice ministry, not magic. She got furious. She said, Wallace, I am dying. Well, then why do you want me to come over there and anoint you with oil? Because it will be a sign that even in the midst of my death, the promises of my baptism are full and true. That Thursday, the pastor and session of the Presbyterian Church came and anointed her with oil. The third task or temptation, and we'll end on this one, there is in death a, a challenge to discern what do you hold on to and what do you let go of. Uh, one of the beauties of the funeral service that we'll look at this afternoon is that the dead actually move somewhere and we let them go. We actually let them go. But there is always from the dying toward us and us toward the dying, what we see in Mary in the 20th chapter of John who's clinging to Jesus. Do not cling to me, he said. I have not yet ascended to my father. When Oliver Sacks was 80, he was still feeling strength and vigor, and he wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying, I feel that my life is not yet complete and I must complete it. Two years later, he had a diagnosis of terminal cancer and he wrote a different kind of editorial in the New York Times. He said, I have now come to the place that I appreciate the Sabbath, the place where it can be pronounced over me, well done, good and faithful servant, you can now enter your rest and let it go. When Stanley Hauerwas wrote his autobiography a few years ago, it was reviewed by a friend of his named Gilbert Mylander, a Lutheran theologian. And he wrote his review in the form of a letter to Stanley Hauerwas, and he said in there a number of critical things about what Hauerwas had revealed in the autobiography. But he finally got to the end of it and he said, I believe that you have spent this whole book trying to find the narrative that will make sense of Stanley Hauerwas. Well, I have some good news for you. You do not have to find the narrative that makes sense of Stanley Hauerwas. It has been given to you in your baptism. It's God who completes the story. So there can be a joyful letting go, both of the dying person and of us of the dying person. Now that raises one more thing, and that is there's grief in all of this. And occasionally you will read that grief comes in stages, Kubler-Ross, baloney. She was not only theologically wrong, she was experientially wrong. 
Grief is like a thunderstorm. It sometimes shows up when you least expect it. It rages and then it's over. Sometimes it lasts for a long time. There are no predictable stages. The attempt to predict stages of grief is a, a futile attempt to control death and keep it away. Um, what we do is we make room for grief, however it needs to be expressed. And that means dwelling with those who are dying, listening to those who die, honoring the stories they want to tell, honoring it when they break down in tears and can't tell stories. Paul said, I want you to uh, hope, uh, I want you to grieve, uh, uh, not as those who have no hope, which doesn't mean don't grieve. It means to grieve as those who have hope. Now we will have some failures at this. Um, I remember when I was a parish minister, I uh, had somebody who was ill at Emory University Hospital, so I went over to visit them. My parents lived at the time near Emory Ver University Hospital, so I thought, well, I'll spend some time with them and then I'll visit the person. I'll kill two birds with one stone. So I went over to my parents' house and I spent a few minutes with them. And then I said, well, I better be shoving off. I've got a patient at Emory Hospital I need to visit. And my mother said, oh, one of my friends is at Emory Hospital. She's been there two weeks. I know she would dearly love to have a visit from you. And of course I responded, mother, I am a pastor of my own church. I have many responsibilities. I don't have time to adjust my schedule every time one of your bridge partners gets sick. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly the way I put it to her. I think what I said was, yes, mother, I'll be happy to visit your <laughs> friend in the hospital. Well, I went to this woman's room and there was a sign on the door, no visitors, family only. So I checked with the nurse's station. The nurse said, well, let me, let me see. So she went in, she came out a few minutes later and she said, she'd like to see you. So I went in, there was this woman. She was perched up on the bed with pillows behind her head. She had a bird-like face. Her eyes were darting around the room. And I said, hi, you don't know me. Uh, I'm Tom Long, I'm a Presbyterian minister. You know my mother. And uh, well, that's as far as I got. She said, what is the meaning of the biblical name Elisha? <laughs> I, I panicked. Uh, <laughs> I resurrected as much of my Hebrew as I could remember. Um, Elisha, El means God, Ish means man, Elisha, man of God. It means man of God. <laughs> That's not what it means. <laughs> but it satisfied her. She said, S sit down. I've been looking for a minister who knows something. <laughs> well, I found behind that bravado was a very frightened woman who was dying. And so I prayed with her, I read a psalm, and I told her I would be back. So two days later, I went back. The sign on the door had changed. No visitors, family only. And then there was a flower drawn in crayon with the word please beside it. I went to the nurse's station, explained the situation. She said, let me check. She came out, she said she wants to see you. I went in and I found out that she had been in the hospital for two and a half weeks and no one from her church had visited her, not even her pastor. She was feeling alone. She felt like she was losing her faith. She felt like God did not love her. So we talked, we prayed, I read a psalm, and I said I'd be back. A few days later I went back and the sign had changed again. No visitors, family only. The flower was crossed out, the word please was crossed out, and then in purple crayon it said, and this means you. I went to the nurse's station. The nurse came out and says she doesn't want to see anybody. And that afternoon, all by herself, she went over to the other side. The frail hands of a Presbyterian minister could not hold her in my embrace. But at her funeral, we were bold to sing songs of resurrection because we believe that on the other side of that doorway was that good shepherd we talked about this morning who lifted her up on his shoulders and took her joyfully home. The failures of our ministry can be woven in to the great faithfulness 
of Jesus' ministry.